Hey, Saris, it's Ocean. Uh, I know you're a good bro when it comes to the magic card things, so I have a proposition for you, one that I don't think you can refuse. I want you to build a goblin deck for me that is reasonably affordable. I want the field to be covered in little goblin friends who will go forth and do my bidding, but with proper cover. But if you don't make this deck for me, I shall feed you to my slivers. Well, I can't say I've ever been threatened into a video before, but I guess screw it, here goes. Well, considering that I have now been bullied into making a commander deck, let's go ahead and see what we can slap together under threat of my family being taken away from me forevermore. D thanks, Ocean Keltoy. Uh, go check out his channel, else he'll probably steal my kidneys. That said, today we're going to be talking about Grum Gully the Generous, who's not a goblin commander, but he is a goblin commander. So, let's get into things. <laughs> Grum Gully is a three mana goblin shaman that says that other non-human creatures get an extra 1-1 one, one counter when they touch the board. So when I said he's a goblin commander, but not a goblin commander, what I mean is this guy has nothing to do with goblins. He doesn't do anything for goblins that goblins want in any particular way, like say Krenko does. However, we are going to use him to synergize with goblins because we're gonna to be tossing our goblins at people's faces over and over and over again. And the extra 1-1 one, one counters Grum Gully will be giving will be used to a wonderful effect in this deck. We're gonna do things like crashing goblins into people's faces in combat, and we're gonna be doing things like getting multiple combats with goblins, and also, we're going to use those 1-1 one, one counters for a couple of infinite combos. So with all that said, let's get into the core strategy and begin with goblin tokens. We want to spawn a ton of those, and we've got 13 dedicated ways of creating said goblin tokens in the deck. Now, the first thing I want to get out of the way is the reason we are making a lot of goblin tokens is because we want to have a maximum benefit from all of the 1-1 one, one counters that our commander is granting. And one of the best ways to do that is by making sure that our board is as wide as possible. This will make sure that our commander is always granting maximum card economy to what we have. Let's begin with Rulikbond's The Warren Chief. This four mana menace goblin, whenever it attacks, lets us look at the top card of our library. If it's a land, we get to drop it on the battlefield for a bit of ramp, and if that card doesn't go on the battlefield, we instead get to make a goblin token. A little bit of ramp, a little bit of goblin tokens. Either way, it comes down as a 4-4 with our commander and spawns a 2-2. That means that the first time this thing attacks, if it gets its ability, we are getting at least six power of goblins on the board for four mana. Or we're getting four mana of goblins and a land on the board for four mana. Either way, card economy is in our favor here. Then we've got Krenko's Command, which will make two 1-1 one, one red goblin tokens. This means that with our commander out, this will be two mana spent for four power of goblins. Again, that is decent return on our investment. Dragon Fodder, likewise, is spawning two 1-1 one, one red goblin tokens. Empty the Warrens is spawning two 1-1 one, one red goblin tokens, but it has Storm. So for every spell we've cast this turn, which we should be able to cast at least one or two, we will get two more red goblin tokens. This means that on a turn where we've casted two spells, Empty the Warrens is letting us pay four mana to get 12 damage worth of goblins on the board. Again, this is just good card economy. Goblin Instigator comes down for two mana and spawns a 1-1 one, one red goblin token. So again, four power of goblins for the low, low cost of two mana. Siege Gang Commander drops three goblins on the board and lets us sacrifice goblins to deal two damage to any target. This means when our goblins are engaged in combat, any goblins that make it through, we can sacrifice them to add their power in damage effectively to any creature that is engaged in combat with one of our goblins so we can kill off an opponent's guard. Or if somebody blocks a bunch of our goblins, we can just sack those goblins instead to burn somebody's life down. Or we can, you know, blow up anything on the board that we might need. So opponent's got a bird's of paradise and they're getting a little too comfy, bolt the bird. Or in this case, throw a goblin at the bird. Hordling Outburst spawns three Three goblins for three mana, which with our commander, as per usual, this means we'll get six goblins in power for three mana. 
squeeze a 2-2 with haste, and whenever it attacks, we can make a 1-1 red goblin creature token. And we're allowed to cast Squee from the graveyard by paying four and exiling four other cards from our graveyard. We don't have a lot of recursion on the deck, so we can do this basically as long as the game keeps on going. Battlecry Goblin can let us pay two to give all of our goblins 1-0 and haste. And if we have six power or more on the battlefield, easy to do because of our commander, we'll make two 1-1 one, one red goblin tokens, or 1-1-1 one, one, one red goblin token, sorry, every time it attacks. Legion War Boss will give us a 1-1 one, one red goblin token every single time we enter combat. Beetleback Chief allows us to create two red goblin tokens when it enters the battlefield. Pashalik Mons gives us one damage to any target anytime one of our goblins dies and allows us to pay four mana to sack a goblin to create two 1-1 one, one red goblin tokens. With our commander, that's four mana for four plus whatever we sacrificed. Not the greatest on card economy, but it will allow us to expand a board outward later in the game when we need a mana sink. Krenko Tin Streak Kingpin is also a wonderful card of the deck. Anytime it attacks, put a 1-1 counter on it and then make 1-1 red goblins equal to the power that Krenko has. This means the first time it swings without our commander, it will make two red goblins. But if our commander's out, this will swing and make three red goblins, then four, then five. And each of those goblins will be spawned as a 2-2 instead of a 1-1, again, because of our commander. Honestly, what our commander does more than anything as opposed to creating goblins is just makes our goblins better and lets us do a shit ton more with those goblins. But counters are very, very important. And we don't just need to put a bunch of goblins on the board. We also need to support our counter strategy with a few supplemental pieces. So we got six cards that do that. This first one is Invigorating Hot Spring. It will enter the battlefield with four 1-1 one, one counters. We can move those 1-1 one, one counters to other creatures, but most importantly, it gives all of our modified creatures haste, which all of our creatures will be modified. Any creature with a 1-1 one, one counter or an equipment or an aura is considered a modified creature. We can remove a 1-1 one, one counter from the Hot Spring to put a 1-1 one, one counter on another creature, but honestly, we don't need to do that that much. Most of the time, we're just going to sit this on the board and let it benefit all of our goblins. Renata is effectively another copy of our commander. She lets our creatures enter the battlefield with another 1-1 counter, and Master Chef lets us double up on our commander's ability once more. Loyal Guardian says that at the beginning of our combat, we can add a 1-1 counter to every creature we control, of which we will have Legion, as we are spawning lots and lots of goblins. Aki Battle Squad says if one of our modified creatures, which they all will be, attack, we can untap all of our modified creatures and then have an additional combat phase after this. Aki Battle Squad is a 6-6 goblin samurai in its own right, so it's very hard to block and still keep your stuff, so we can get two combats a turn with this until our opponents are out of stuff. Also, remember that getting two combats a turn means we get two triggers of Loyal Guardian, adding extra 1-1 counters to our goblin army as the game goes on. Then we have one with the Kami. This card lets us enchant any creature we control, and anytime any of our modified creatures die, we make X 1-1 one, one colorless spirit tokens, where X is that creature's power. This allows us to ram our goblins into our opponent's faces, and if they block and kill our goblins, we will spawn X spirits, and those spirits will gain power and toughness because of our commander. After that happens, guess what that means? Well... We can swing with those too. All of those spirit tokens will be modified because of our commander. This allows us to, if our opponents are constantly blowing up our cards, basically create a an ever doubling army. At least that's the threat. So people will be more likely to allow our goblins to sneak under the radar and punch people in the gonads. You know, right about until the point where they die. There's some other neat tricks we can do with one with the Kami in this deck, and I'll get into those here in a second. First, I want to pull your attention to one of the recursion pieces in the deck. It's the only one we're running in this build, but it is a huge one, Evolution Witness. Any time this card is given a 1-1 counter, we get to return a permanent from our graveyard to our hand. It's so easy to distribute 1-1 counters onto this thing. Either we get them automatically because of our commander, or we throw them on it with Invigorating Hot Spring or other shenanigans. Evolution Witness will be able to get you lots of cards throughout a game the longer it is on the board, especially if you start pumping in upgrades like the Ozolith or something like that that allows you to just ram counters onto this thing. But 
I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's get into how we're going to be winning the game. Now, while combat is an efficient way to win a lot of our games, and we are going to be relying on that for the most part, we actually have some infinite combos that we can lean into that are easy to disrupt, and that's kind of the way I like them. I prefer infinite combos to be something that people can deal with very easily so that we don't end up dominating a board. But let's get into the first infinite combo we are going to be using with the Oops, I Win section. Let's look at Scuzzback Marauders. This is a Goblin Warrior with Persist. This means that if the creature dies, if it had no negative one, negative one counters on it, it'll pop on the battlefield with a negative one, negative one counter on it. Now, normally this would mean we're paying five mana for a five, two trampling goblin that turns into a four, one trampling goblin, and that's that. But in our deck, that's not quite what's happening. You see, Wizards of the Coast is a company with elegant game design. They never make mistakes at all. Which is why, for some weird, strange, awkward reason, the 1-1 one, one counter and the negative 1-1 one, negative one counter cancel each other out. I've never understood this rule, and I play hardened scales in modern, but for some weird reason, if a creature has a negative 1-1 one, negative one counter on it and a 1-1 one, one counter, they just both fall off instantly. So, if the Scuzzback Marauder dies, it comes onto the battlefield, our commander gives it a 1-1 one, one counter, and the creature will give itself a negative 1-1 one, negative one counter, canceling everything out, and it's basically a vanilla Scuzzback Marauders again. This allows it to come back on the board infinite times if we have a sack outlet that allows us to sacrifice it infinite times. And wouldn't you know it, Goblin Bombardment is is a sacrifice outlet that allows us to sacrifice a goblin infinite times. It lets us sacrifice any creature, really, but it's perfectly on theme, letting us sack a creature uh, and then deal damage with a card specifically called Goblin Bombardment. So if the Bombardment's on the board, our commander's on the board, and Scuzzback is on the board, we basically win. We get to sacrifice that goblin infinite times and deal infinite damage. But what if you want to still win with combat damage? Well, I've got a couple cards for you. Goblin Sledder and Mog Raider. Both of these are effectively the same card. So let's look at what they do. Goblin Sledder lets us sacrifice a goblin to give a creature 1-1 one, one until end of turn. So let's say you've got a board of eight goblins, and they're ready to swing out at your opponent. And you've got Scuzzback Marauders and your commander on the board. You play something like Mog Raider or Goblin Sledder, they are the exact same card, and then you sacrifice Scuzzback Marauders 12 billion times. This allows you to add 12 billion instances of plus one plus one amongst any number of your goblins. Now you just have to turn them sideways at somebody and watch them die. Now, Goblin Sledder only works with Scuzzback Marauders, but if you decided to upgrade the deck and add something like a Maskwood Nexus in, then it becomes a lot more easy to use this for infinite combat damage. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Goblin Bombardment's the card I want to focus on right now, because it has two other cards it could go infinite with, Ophis and Lesser Manticore. Both of these effectively go infinite with it because they have Persist, and that's the only reason they're in the deck. If we had more ways of getting Persist onto Goblins, then we would be running them, but in our budget, we don't have access to things like Maskwood Nexus. Not yet, anyway. But we gotta go back into the combat strategies for the next two cards. The first one is Fangs of Col uh, Colonia. It's a new card for Modern Horizons 3, and for one mana, we can put a 1-1 one, one counter on a creature, then double the 1-1 one, one counters on the creature. Or for six mana, we can overload it and double the amount of 1-1 one, one counters on all of our creatures. All of our creatures will have at least one or two 1-1 one, one counters to begin with because of our commander, so this is effectively an overrun effect without the trample. But since we're going as wide as we are with goblins, as far as I'm concerned, we probably won't need the trample if you're activating this. But let's say that you want another way to get in, an evasive way to get in. Burn is an evasive way to get in, and Thundering Raiju does just that. This card, when it attacks, we get to put a 1-1 counter on any creature we control, and then deal X damage to every opponent, where X is the number of modified creatures we control other than Thundering Raiju. Since our deck is comprised entirely of creatures that will be modified because of our commander, in a standard scenario where we've got 8 or 9 goblins, tokens or otherwise, they probably have 1-1 one, one counters. This means the turn you attack with Thundering Raiju, you're dealing 9 damage minimum to all of your opponents. Now, let's say that you have Aki Battle Squad on the board still. 
then you're going to be getting this ability twice because, well, of course you are. And remember that at the beginning of combat, we have effects that allow us to get extra goblins or spawn goblins when we attack. This means if we have extra combats and we have Thundering Raiju, we probably just win the game right now. This effectively gives our deck three axes to win on. We can either win via burn damage with combat triggers, we can win with straight up combat damage by punching people in the face with goblins, or we can win with a variety of infinite combos if we need to rely on those. This means no matter what we're up against, we should have some way of killing our opponent. And remember, things like Mog Raider give us a insurance policy against people with life gain decks. If we sacrifice an enough goblins or do an infinite goblin sacrifice combo and give all that power to our commander, we can say, hey, I don't care that you have 12 bajillion life, I just need to do 21 commander damage to you. This means that our deck has plenty of ways to close out a game, but how are we going to be digging through our deck in the first place? <laughs> All the draw power in this deck should be either independently good, benefit from the damage that we're able to dish out with our goblins, or benefit directly from the amount of goblins we have on the board. This way our draw package will synergize with the deck. So. Let's go ahead and look at the 10 card draw package that we've selected here. Beginning with Collective Unconscious, let's, let's draw a card for every single creature we control. That's a pretty easy thing to just understand on its surface. If we've got a field of 8 or 9 goblins, this draws us 8 or 9 cards. Shamanic Revelation will do the same thing while also letting us gain 4 life for every creature with power 4 or greater on the board. That won't be many of them, but if we've stacked up our 1-1 counter doubling stuff, we will have a great benefit from this card. But even in that scenario, where we don't have a lot of creatures that are big enough, drawing a card for every creature we control is still very good. Return of the Wild Speaker is a pseudo overrun effect, giving all of our goblins plus three plus three until end of turn, or drawing us a card equal to the greatest power amongst them that we have. In some scenarios, this is just going to draw us three or four cards, and that's okay. But again, if we've stacked up enough 1 1 counters on something, or we've done something silly like dumped a bunch of power onto something with, say, Mog Raider, then you can see where this can draw us lots and lots of cards. Inspiring Call is a way to protect all of our creatures with 1-1 one, one counters and giving them indestructible until end of turn, while also drawing us a card for every creature who has those counters. Null Spine Dragon is a great 1-2 punch if we can drop it on the board after we've hit people for combat damage or dealt burn damage to them, and draw cards equal to the damage dealt to a single opponent this turn. Harmonize is independently decent, letting us draw 3 cards. Armorcraft Judge will draw us a card for every 1-1 one, one counter on the board, or every creature with a 1-1 one, one counter on it, rather. Rob the Archives gives us an impulse draw with the ability to get two extra cards from it if we sacrifice one of our goblins. Pretty easy thing to understand. Owlbear Shepherd is a wonderful goblin in this deck. At the beginning of our end step, if the creatures we have have total power 8 or greater, we get to draw a card. We probably will always have creatures with power great enough for this. With just our commander and this on the board, we've already fulfilled a lot of that power requirement by having five power, since this will come down with a 1-1 one, one counter. All you have to do is have two more 1-1 one, one goblins with counters, or one 2-2 two, two goblin with a counter, and suddenly Albear Shepard is giving you everything you need. But... Finally, we have Goblin Matron. When this enters the battlefield, we can search our library for any goblin card, reveal that card, and put it in our hand. Normally, I'm not really big on tutors, but in a $15 deck where it's sometimes very important to get an edge over our opponents with card economy, I don't think this card is the worst thing in the world. And most of the time, let's be honest, the thing you're going to be tutoring with this is going to be Scuzzback Marauders. Since once you have Scuzzback Marauders, a lot of the combos in the deck go online. A lot of them just start working very, very well. Hell, if Scuzzback is on the board, we can use the Pauschlik Mons to sacrifice it over and over again as a mana dump to keep making more and more tokens, just as one example of a non-infinite combo that really wants the Scuzzback Marauders. So most of the time, just let Goblin Matron grab the thing you need. But we also need to make sure our opponents are not winning the game. So let's get into how we're going to cuck them.
Alrighty, let's talk about disrupting what our opponents are trying to do, and let's talk about the 12 cards I've picked to do just that. Starting with Street Urchin. This says that commander creatures we own allow, allow us to sacrifice a creature to deal one damage to any target. With the amount of ways we have to benefit from persisting creatures, you can see how this allows us to basically aim a sniper rifle at most things on the board. Wreck and Rebuild can be ramp in a pinch, but otherwise lets us blow off an artifact or an enchantment. Decimate lets us blow off an artifact, creature, enchantment, and land. Return to Nature lets us get rid of a card in a graveyard if we need, while also giving us access to artifact and enchantment removal. Goblin Raise Runners allows us to sack a land to give it a 1-1 counter if we desperately need it, but otherwise, at the beginning of our end step, we can have a deal damage equal to the number of 1-1 counters it has to any player or a Planeswalker, giving us an easy way to get rid of Planeswalkers, even if they are being defended by a Legion of Tokens. Reclamation Sage can blow up an artifact or enchantment when it drops on the board. Barrage of Expendables lets us sacrifice a creature to deal 1 damage to any target. A Braid gives us the ability to deal 3 damage to a creature, or blow up an artifact. Canker Bloom lets us proliferate all of our 1-1 counters, or blow up an artifact or an enchantment. Arms Dealer lets us sacrifice a Goblin to deal 4 damage to any creature. This, with our Persist creatures, is also ridiculously important. If we have Scuzz back on the board, the Arms Dealer, and our Commander, we can effectively wipe the board clean with enough mana. Airdrop Condor allows us to sacrifice a Goblin and deal damage equal to to its power to any creature or player. We can use this to end the game for someone, or we can use this to deal plenty of goblin powers worth of damage. Remember, every time we sacrifice the Scuzzbag Marauders, we'll be dealing five damage to something. Then we have Woodfall Primus. This lets us blow up any non-creature permanent on the board when it enters the battlefield. It also has Persist, meaning that this is one of the nastiest ways we have to end the game. Let me explain. You already know what our commander does with Persist. It basically lets us ignore Persist and just treat it as an auto-revive. So let's say that you have, oh, I don't know, this card and Goblin Bombardment. If somebody's under damage protection or anything like that, and we're not able to just repeatedly destroy their life points, we can ruin the game for them in other ways. By sacrificing our Woodfall Primus over and over again, and just destroying their lands. They don't need them, but we don't want them to have them. Finally, we've got two board wipes that we want to use. One is Chain Reaction, dealing X damage to every creature, where X is the number of uh, creatures on the battlefield, and Structural Assault, which will let us blow up all the artifacts on the board. Our deck only has four anyway, and then we get to deal damage to every creature equal to the number of artifacts that were put into the graveyard this turn. This will usually blow up everybody's mana rocks and then get rid of all of their creatures all at the same time. But... This costs five mana. How are we gonna get five mana? So while this deck is very low to the ground, some of its haymakers do cost a bit, so we want to be able to pay for those no matter what. So let's start with our first ramp piece, Goblin Anacromancer. We've got 12 pieces of ramp to go through, and this guy is doing lots of work. For two mana, he lets all of our red or green spells cost one less. That is huge. Uh, he's also a goblin, so he's perfect. Wayfair's Bobble can sack itself to give us a land from the deck. Skirt Prospector gives us an infinite sack outlet for goblins that can transform them into mana. If this is on the board with Scuzzback, we can use this to just generate infinite red mana. Rishkar allows us to turn all of our creatures with 1-1 counters into mana dorks, and it gives two 1-1 counters when it comes on the board anyway. Font of Fertility is basically Wayfair's Bobble, but green. Dawn Shredder Elk is the reverse of that. Sacrifice it to get a basic land for two mana and one instead of one mana and two. Beanstalker Giant can search our library for a land to put on the battlefield untapped, while also letting it be a creature in its own right later that will help us with cards like Return of the Wild Speaker, giving us access to a B creature that we can use to draw cards. Fertilid comes onto the battlefield with two 1-1 one, one counters, and we can remove any of those counters to get a land from our deck onto the battlefield. Now remember, it's going to come on with three 1-1 one, one counters because of our commander, and whatever else we end up stacking on it afterwards. Search for Tomorrow lets us search for our library for a land and drop it on the battlefield untapped. We can also play it turn 1 with Suspend. Wild Growth is another turn 1 ramp spell that enchants one of our lands and lets us tap it for 1 mana. Arcane Signet and Ornithopter are the generic mana getters for two mana that we have access to. 
And with that, that's all of the mana acceleration in the deck. As for the land package, we're going with 10 forests and 12 mountains. We have five dual lands available, Cinderglade, Command Tower, Mossfire Valley, Game Trail, and Gruel Turf. Gruel Turf gets a another wonderful mention here because it actually acts as a way to recycle utility lands if we need it to. Then we have six fetching lands, Escape, Tunnel, Terramorphic Expanse, and Evolving Wilds, all being effectively the same card. Drop it on the board, tap it, sack it, get a basic land. Naya Panorama, Shire Terrace, and Promising Vein are also equal copies of the same card. It comes on the battlefield untapped, gives us mana if we need it, and if we need the land color desperately, we can sack it to get a land color that we need, leaving us with two utility lands, Pit of Offerings, and Path of Ancestry. Path of Ancestry gives us a scry every time we play a creature with the same type as our commander. We got plenty of goblins for that. And Pit of Offerings. When this touches the battlefield, we get to exile three target cards from graveyards and then get mana in the colors of the cards that we exile. We can just use this to get rid of problematic recursion targets, and we can use Gruel Turf to recycle that later if we need. So that's it for the entirety of the deck, but what would happen if you had a little more money that you wanted to pump into this thing? Well, let's get into that. Now, a quick word about upgrading a deck like this. You want to make sure that anything that you are taking out is not something that is necessary for the deck strategy. After that, it's going to be just vibes and flavor base. You pick what you want, and you pick what matters the most to you. That said, I've got about 26 cards I think would do well in any upgrade path you choose to go with with this deck, so let's get into those, beginning with Stump Stomp. It is a removal spell from the new Modern Horizons 3 set. Target creature creature deals damage equal to its power to any creature or planeswalker. The big thing is it's a land on the other side, so it's easy to fit into any deck. Chaos Warp would give you an easy access to Omni Removal. I just couldn't fit it in the deck's budget this time around. Goblin War Chief, same thing, couldn't fit it in the budget. Gives all of our goblins one mana discount and also haste. Impact Tremors, anytime one of our goblins touches the board, we get to deal one damage to every opponent. We can use this with one of our infinite persist engines to just end the game instantly. Krenko Mob Boss lets us create X11 red goblin creature tokens where X is the number of goblins we control. We can use this to create an ever growing army of goblins. Evolution Sage allows us to proliferate all of the counters on all of our goblins. Skirt Fire Marshal lets us tap three or tap five untapped goblins to deal 10 damage to every creature and every player. If all of our opponents are even a little bit under our health, we can use this to just end the game instantly. Hardened Scales is another copy of our commander's ability. Beast Within is another Omni removal like Chaos Warp. Branching Evolution lets us double up on our commander's ability. Beast Whisper gives us an extra draw package. Kami of the Whispering Hopes is a wonderful mana dork that is a Hardened Scales in its own right, letting us double up on our commander's ability and also giving us extra mana for every 1-1 counter on. Blasphemous Act is one of the most mana efficient removal board wipes in the game. Incubation Druid is a two mana mana dork that becomes a three mana producing dork as long as our commander was on the board when we dropped it on the board. Rishkar's Expertise allows us to draw a bunch of cards and play a spell for free. Balagad Recovery is Recursion with a land on the backside. Goblin Trash Master is another infinite sack outlet for goblins that allow us to destroy artifacts. Ozlith Shatter Spire is once again another copy of our commander's ability. Val Delicate Awakening is a wheel that is a land on the back side. Court of Garenbrig is a way to double all the counters on all of our goblins every combat. Heroic Intervention can stop us from losing our goblins on a critical turn. Tribute to the World Tree can either give us 1-1 counters on our small goblins or draw us cards whenever our big goblins touch the board. And Arwen Weaver of Hope is, yet again, another way to double up on our commander's ability. This will add 1-1 counters on every creature that comes onto the battlefield equal to the toughness of Arwen. So if the commander was out, then Arwen comes out, that will come out as a 3-2, and then it will give two 1-1 one, one counters to every goblin that comes onto the board after the fact. Bristly Bill allows us to double the amount of 1-1 one, one counters on every single creature we control, and gives us a landfall ability of adding a single 1-1 one, one counter onto any creature, and the Ozolith allows us to permanently store any of the 1-1 one, one counters on goblins whenever they die, so that we can just hold on to them forever, and whenever our goblins die, we get to redistribute those 1-1 one, one counters every single turn, and get tons and tons of power that we get to consolidate. Until they kill this, our goblins will basically be infinitely 
extremely powerful. No matter how many of them die, their 1-1 one -one counters will stick around forever. Uh, you can also add in any number of free sack outlets, like, say, Ashnod's Altar or Phyrexian's Altar, if you decided to go a more aristocraty route. But that is entirely up to you. So let's talk about how I feel about this thing. In conclusion, I believe that I saved both my family and my kidneys from being molested by an army of slivers uh, toted around by one strange bald pagan man. Uh, also, uh, go subscribe to his channel and stuff. You know, things I have to say because of the proverbial gun pointed to my head. That all said, I think y'all will enjoy this deck a ton. I've wanted to make a Grumgully deck for a while, and this was a perfect excuse to make one. And no, I'm not saying that because it's part of the script that allows me to keep everybody I love dear, uh, alive and well, and with most of their internal organs intact, I think that you'll enjoy the deck a lot too. It's got a lot of silly ways to just go out of control on a whim, and while I may not be the biggest fan of infinite combos, I recognize sometimes the game has gone on too long, and it's time to just shut everybody up with a goblin combo. Also, uh, the only other thing I would have been adding to this is like an Acroma's Memorial so that we could have sky raiding goblins attacking people. But that's something that you can add in if you want to later. I think the deck should function very well as is. And the only thing I'm concerned about is the fact that I forgot to put a myriad landscape in there. I'm just now realizing that. Anyways, hopefully you all enjoyed the deck. Leave it a like, subscribe if you haven't already, do all that fun stuff the YouTube algorithm cares about. And uh, real quick, if you don't want to hear about politics, I'm going to go ahead and talk about it for just a few seconds. Yeah, trigger warning for that and all. Hop off the video if you don't want to hear about it right now. But I do want to leave this video with a message real quick, as this is the first video I'm making coming back uh, after the events of the weekend. I understand right now everything may feel like it's all falling apart. It may feel like a literal trump card, a martyr card, was handed to one of the most vile people on the planet. And it may be very, very hard to feel like things are going to be functional and stable after that fact. I understand that. The Supreme Court is packed. It looks like the polling data is coming in in favor of one of the worst things imaginable to happen to this country. And if you are a supporter of that person, I don't know if you really belong in this particular audience. This is a channel that affirms trans rights, and this is a country that is currently at threat of losing those rights, as that's one of the first things that that person, Trump, has said will happen if he becomes president. So I do want to tell the trans people in my audience and the people who are allies otherwise, we're going to make it through this. We got this. It's very easy to fall into despair, but there's plenty of stuff you can do in the meantime to help counteract things. No matter how many executive orders come through, we do have the ability together to get as involved in politics as we can via phone banking and canvassing and running for our own local offices to try to keep things stable from the inside while the outside does everything in its power to push in drastically. Just keep your heads on tight. Don't feel like everything's going to fall apart. But I also want to let you all know it probably would be a good idea, just in case, to have an exit plan if you need to. Those of you who have the means, who haven't gotten your passports yet, now's probably the time to get those and have them available. This is a very connected age of the internet. If you've got friends in other countries that are willing to house you in case the worst happens here, just having that ability there, it can give a lot of peace of mind. That all said, let me know what you think in the comment section below. Hit the like button if you haven't already, and just let me know you guys are going to stay safe, okay? Insert end of video tagline here. Hey, I just quickly want to give a thank you to all of my wonderful patrons who keep this show running. YouTube and Twitch are a pretty bumpy ride at the best of times, and the stability that Patreon provides me is worth more than I can say. I'd also like to thank each and every one of my $20 and up patrons here. And they would be Red Joker, Britzkrieg, Cameron, Dren, Gemshin, Smiling DM, Poundini, Mabity Babity, Naomi, Isaac, Agamotto, Jordan, Ravi, Juni, Kiratorian, Prisma, all of you, Sagitta, I'm not saying that part, and Starlight. And finally, thank you to everyone else that helps keep this channel alive. While you're here, why not check out another video? And thank you for watching.